Okay, aloha, everybody. Um, my name is Nigel. I'm a planner with Kua, and I'm excited to bring Clay here to talk about fires and share his knowledge with us to see how we can um, better prepare, I guess, our communities for um, fire risks and mitigation and maybe how our efforts could, um, yeah, take into account fires to be more resilient. And um, Clay prepared some slides here and uh, we'll just jump into talking story and asking questions um, as, as we can. So mahalo again, Clay. I'm yeah. hand it to you. Thank you. Thank Grace. you. Thank, thanks, Nigel. Um, yeah, so uh, Clay uh, Traunick, based at University of Hawaii and Manoa, and I'm in a cooperative extension program. So my job is kind of to try to try to understand what folks are, the problems folks are dealing with out in the field. And I've been doing stuff with wildfire for a long time um, and also more like watershed protection and watershed management um, more generally as well. And so try to figure out like how UH can better help folks working on the ground. And, and so fire, it's kind of cool because it's pretty practical, right? It's like not, it's really intuitive what drives risk. And then it's hard to say or identify um, you know, if you're kind of working on building resilience, if you're like caring for a landscape, you're probably reducing fire risk. Anything you're doing with vegetation from like mowing the lawn to planting trees, anything along that is like, you're actually probably um, helping with fire risk. But then obviously that also sets you up to like be vulnerable, right? If you And that's the, the tr tricky part with fire is that you have to be thinking like big picture, like beyond your field site or your house or anything, right? It's like really more about the larger landscape because um, the ones that we worry about, these large fires that cause damage to natural resources or to your uh, property, things like that are the big ones. So it's a very small percentage of those fires that happen, um, but it's, you know, they're, they we're talking thousands of acres, right? And there's actually two right now today burning um, one in, Koala Ranch on Big Island and on up 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 country Maui. Um, so we're gonna end up seeing what what's happening with those. But also it's like if the fire's burning, I guess the other message is like it's probably too late for you to do much of anything at all. Um, that's really the job of the firefighters. So that's also not my job. Like I do fire science and prediction and stuff, but it's more about what we do beforehand. I mean, that's that's the bottom line is like that. Quote, what is like a ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um so let me see if I can. Sh I'm just kind of run through some of the basics, and I probably, given this such a small audience, <laughs> we can ask questions and keep it pretty informal. So if you have questions, like at any point, um, you know, just you can feel free to stop me. Otherwise, I might ramble. So let's see. Do you guys? Uh, you're seeing, you're seeing the presenter view. Swap displays. How about that? Right. Swap, so yeah maybe swap it back oh swap it back okay swap it back yeah that was good then okay um, this one is good yeah so i give these i've given this similar versions of this talk to folks like in hawaii and elsewhere on like so this picture is actually from guam so south southern guam has a particularly gnarly fire problem they've got lots of these grasslands you can see burning and you know obviously the big impetus for us to protect these places or prevent or manage fire better is just all the effects it has. Like we're not so concerned with the fire itself, but it's like what a fire does to what we value, right? Whether it's forest or whether it's a reef or erosion, things like that. So, um, and it's all part of the cycle. So I was just saying earlier, if the fire's happening, like it's this little teeny piece of the puzzle, right? It's just, that's happening in the moment. There's not a lot of things besides getting yourself and your loved ones to, to safety, right? Getting out of the way. Um, but there's all these other pieces of the puzzle that we're kind of dealing with. So suppression, like that's putting the fire out, the wet stuff on the red stuff, as they like to say. And you know, the, there's things you can do after the fire to kind of help uh, recover. But what I'm gonna be talking about today is the stuff on top, um, prevention, which is really just about educating people, reducing ignitions, and then mitigation. In other words, just reducing the risk of fire. Um, and so I'll show you some resources and kind of go through some of the um, things to think about. It's really what are we, what areas do we need to be thinking about in the built environment and the natural environment uh, to reduce risk? And, and just the starters, like fire is actually pretty simple. As I was saying earlier, it's, it's pretty intuitive. Like 
we know like dry and windy hot weather is higher fire risk. Um, so there's these three pieces, that's the climate piece or weather. Um, it, almost all of our fires are started by people, right? So that kind of ties into the prevention piece about trying to figure out how to make, help people make better decisions um, and understand when conditions are risky. And then the vegetation, uh, and, and our big problem here, why fire risk is pretty intuitive is, is if you have grass and you've got lots of grass, which is at Palihua, for example, um, you're going to have high fire risk at certain times of the year, right? This grass is highly sensitive to these wet, dry cycles. And, and in terms of weather and climate, it, it kind of does two things to us. We you sort of have the bear the brunt of both the wet times, um, kind of like late this winter has got lots and lots of rain that makes all that grass grow. And then once it dries out, either a dry season comes or you get drought, out of season drought, um, all that grass cures. And that's really what um, defines our fire problem. And in like the historical sense, we're kind of a victim to um, the declines that we've seen in agriculture and ranching across the state. Like that's the primary culprit. Um, and we've seen dramatic increases in fire over the past few decades. And that's the big reason. It's not so much climate. I mean, climate change and dry conditions will make it harder, but it's really the fact that we're not tending or doing the same things on the landscape at the scale that was done in the past. Um, and then this is also kind of how fire people frame things, these values at risk, which is kind of a funny term, but it just means like, we're not, again, concerned about the fire as much as we are about the stuff it impacts, right? So from forest resources and other, you know, uh, farmland, things like that, to municipal impacts, there is shutting down roads uh, and, and people, that's usually the biggest complaint uh, during these big fires. All that soil that gets exposed in these large fires, it gets more prone to erosion. So you get these downstream sedimentation that happens on the reefs. Um, and then of course, like the, the our homes and communities, right? So that's the, it's the public safety part. And the public safety, that's what the fire departments, that's their primary concern, right? So a lot of times when I'm talking about this stuff with folks that uh, you know, work in the forest, they're always like, oh, why aren't they going up there to put these fires out? And, and it's two reasons. It's one is that it's their own safety they have to worry about. And a lot of those places are very hard to work in. But it's also that the priority is once the people are safe, right, then we can kind of worry about these other areas. But um, so today, yeah, I think I already said this, just kind of understand like what things we can do to be proactive uh, to reduce risk. And then just a little bit about identifying what things create hazards, right? Um, and so there's kind of two pieces to this. It's like understanding the um, factors in the natural environment that cause fire and how fire moves and where it's gonna come from and, and go towards, but also like the built environment. And this is something that gets overlooked quite a bit. Um, and a lot of times when we're thinking about reducing risk and preparing for fire, some of those things can be a little bit simpler to tackle than all of a sudden having to think about, you know, sort of weed whacking miles and miles of fire breaks, for example. And, and all of this is taken from these resources that we have online. So I um, helped with this project called Pacific Fire Exchange. It's just like an information sharing uh, science communication project um, that I work on this with Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization. I'll probably talk about them in a little bit. Um, so there's resources. There's a pre-fire planning guide and a fuel breaks management guide so how to like kind of reduce fuels uh, fuel risk fire risk through managing fuels and you can find this on the website so all this information that i'm going to be talking about is there in case you miss anything or have questions and so as i said there's kind of two areas two pieces of this world that create hazards um and it's like identifying where those hazards stack up and which ones are kind of within our power to tackle right um so the fire environment is really about vegetation you know that's like we can't do much about the climate we can't do much about ignition sources too much right so it's in direct control our direct control is um the fire environment and then the built environment is more about understanding like public access and sources of ignitions uh as well as uh access for firefighters right access and water right so these are like the things that we can do to make the firefighters jobs safer which is a huge, huge, it's the whole goal really, because <laughs> they're gonna come, right? You got a fire, they're coming. And the extent to which they're able to put that fire out is gonna depend on these kind of conditions that they see when they arrive. So people, 
any questions so far? I, I, I'm just going to welcome Ginger. So you're you're coming in the middle, but no worries. You can, you, if there's anything that I like jumped over and you have questions about, just, just let me know. Um, so the built environment, the first thing to think about is people. And so most of our fires are started by, by people. Um, about 75% are accidental, which, you know, means they're preventable. If someone made a better decision, you might not have had that fire. That, um, so this is really kind of identify when you think about people as like where you might be vulnerable. If you're dealing with like a large land area, for example, like you're going to have higher uh, rates of ignition around roadsides or anywhere where people are, you have more people. And so in the sense of like kind of managing even fuels, you'd be thinking about like, you can either try to contain the ignitions, right? Like manage the fuels to make it less likely to the fires to start or manage fuels like around the areas like your home or maybe like forested areas that you're trying to protect, right? It's sort of, sort of like two little strategies to think about. And then there's these things that we can do um, to educate the public, both to reduce the risk around their houses, but also to change their behavior, um, which is a difficult task, but it's kind of, you know, it, it really falls into, or it falls upon us to try, at least try to educate folks about how to, what activities to avoid and when, and there's a ton of resources out here. This is a wildfire and drought lookout is a sort of campaign that we work on with Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization, a bunch of uh, agencies, Division of Forestry and Wildlife, um, the local fire departments. And we've got this guide, this ready, set, go. And this is more about what to do around your home, around the household, the steps you can take to, to be safe and, and protect your home. So if you're in a house that's like on the edge, right, where you've got lots of grass and large uh, kind of Un, uncared for untended vegetation um, that that might be useful resource for you uh, access as I said earlier is the huge thing like the fire fighters are only really going to go in where they know they can get in safely where they know they're not going to be surrounded by fire where they can turn their vehicles around um, finding your place you know think about Camp Palihua like hopefully a lot of the firefighters locally know where you are but like how to get up there, how many gates do they have to go through? Are there bridges that they have to cross so they have to know what the weight limits are, right? So all of these things about can the firefighters find your place uh, and get there uh, in the event of a fire? The other thing about access is just anticipating when they set a stage up, when they're staging for a fire, they're gonna bring in all this heavy equipment um, so you know if they're gonna be rolling onto your property or a place that you care for, maybe understanding and letting them know where they can like cause the least amount of damage and, and be safe, right? Not have lots of big grass and like scary eucalyptus trees or something like that around them so that they can they can do their job safely and minimize the impacts they'll have uh, on your on your property or where, where you where you live or work. Um, and then water is the obvious one. Uh, it's, you know, it's obviously a critical resource and it's a really limiting factor, especially when we're talking about like brush fires when you're up on top of the mountain, having access to water is major. Um, so if there's reservoirs they're able to pump out of, but can they like back their trucks up to them, right? Like are those line edges hardened? Um, do your tanks have fittings that, that they can access, right? Do they, is there, so we worked with a farmer in Waianae, for example, they installed a standpipe right to their main irrigation pipe and they got a fitting that the firefighters can tie right into in Waianae so that they can fill up the tankers and have high pressure water. Um, you can also do things if there's natural features like streams and ditches, just deepen them so give them access so they can actually, you know, pump, pump out of them. And then, really just like the infrastructure around like what kind of buildings uh, and how they might create hazards, right? So we've got flammable material, propane tanks, things like that. And it's not so much of like um, just knowing where those those hazards might be. And again, from your own safety stand uh, concerns, but also, you know, to let letting firefighters know uh, what's around there. If there's junk and stuff like that, I mean, that's what causes big hazards for firefighters when they're responding. It's just like old cars and crap like that out there. Plastic debris, you know, from irrigation piping and things like that. Um, this is important. If you can point these kinds of hazards out, if you know where they are, um, a lot of times during a fire, you can actually help quite a bit. And then just local knowledge of the place, like where can they find these resources? If there's water available, right? If there's gates that you can get open for them. Um, you know, back in the day, one of the big limitations too nowadays is that back in the day, the plantation, uh, 
and farms would have water trucks on hand, right? And none of that's around. So these guys show up and they're pretty much flying blind, oftentimes responding to these incidents. Okay, any questions about the built environment? And I start with that because again, some of those features might be like lower hanging fruit to tackle. Like if you're dealing with a large landscape or you're dealing even with a neighborhood, some of those things might be uh, a bit easier to tackle before thinking about managing this part, which is the fire environment, which is like the fuels um, and, and sort of how the mountain and all these other things kind of combine to, to influence where fire moves over the landscape. Um, and just to give you a sense of how, again, this is maybe more for like people working on the mountain, um, but topography has a huge influence on how fire moves over the landscape. And so this can kind of help you figure out like where you might want to do like changing the vegetation or do fuel breaks. So for example, if fire's burning up a slope, it burns way faster than burning down slope. Um, as you can see this in this photo, what we have here is like fire moving up the hill and fire moving down the hill. And the other difference, why it's such a bigger flame length on this part moving up the mountain is because that slope is south facing, right? So you've got the south facing slope, the fire's burning up and it's just raging, right? So you imagine like having a fire break on that, the effectiveness of, of cutting a line to that fuel versus cutting a line where it's a north facing wet slope and the fire's just trickling downhill. Um, so that's just kind of more awareness about where you might kind of try to tackle some of the things I'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, and then weather and climate play a heavy role. Like we don't really get fires after big, big rains. Um, and this combination is it's like drought, right? Dry conditions, high winds, and low humidity. Uh, and I was just telling Nigel, we are actually experiencing an event today. It's pretty unique, I think, to the tropical Pacific where we have a hurricane passing to the south of us. And what that hurricane is doing, it's drawing all this moisture in towards it, right? Like this big low pressure system, it's sucking up all this moisture, creating these high winds. And so we're kind of have these perfect alignment of dry conditions, high winds, low relative humidity. Uh, and we're the, which is driving the fires that we're seeing today on Maui and, and Big Island. Um, and this is a good resource, the U.S. Drought Monitor. If you're curious or you're trying to communicate with people about fire risk, the Drought Monitor is a really cool tool. It's updated weekly. And if you know you're in one of these abnormally moderate, dry, or higher, um, that fire risk is definitely elevated. Majority of the fires in the state, 75% happen uh, in, in one of these categories. So, um, yeah, and then the wind, that's the big piece, right? So as far as planning, we are driven by the trade winds. So that's predominant so that you know that, you know, for the most part, fire is going to move the direction that the wind moves. And so this, again, it comes down to planning is trying to anticipate like where is fire likely to approach you from, right? Where, where are the ignitions happening? Like the people part, and then where is that likely to kind of move across the landscape with the fire? And just to get say, like was the fire, it moves with the wind, you get these big kind of scary flame lengths, but it's moving into the wind, uh, it's much more easy to manage. And so like a fuel break right in front of this fire would be much more effective than one uh, in front of this. Um, and this, the other resource here is that National Weather Service actually has a Hawaiian fire weather, like a forecast that they do if you're interested to see what, what can, current conditions are. Ooh, I'm going to skip this one because this is more for the Western Pacific where they have like dry season and wet season. And so there, for them, it's much more predictable. Um, we do obviously have um, wet and dry season, but, you know, kind of leeward sides can be dry any time of the year and we get out of season drought. So, um, and then the fuel type, and this is again goes really back to intuition. Uh, the grasses, the surface fuels, are really the primary culprit we're dealing with in Hawaii. Like they're the ones that are really sensitive, as I was saying, to drying out. Um, but if you've got like structures and you've got a bunch of like shrubs and stuff growing up right next to the structure, which we call ladder fuels, that's the kind of scenario where you can get a surface fire that will actually jump up into the tree canopy or up in, you know, and climb up and get into roofs, things like that. Um, so just understanding that the surface fuels are our main culprit, but when you have these other woody vegetation in there, they can cause fire to move up and actually cause more damage um, and burn and burn hotter. Uh, yeah. And, this really just comes back to like the problems with fuels. This is actually a picture from Palau. Um, so this idea that we are, same in Hawaii, we kind of deal with this mix of like forest and grassland. 
And almost all of our fires really start in these grasslands and they can move into the forest uh, and damage that. But we're, we're it's really the grasses, grassy, these savannas that we're they're dealing with. And the map of the vegetation types on Oahu kind of shows this pretty clearly, just how vulnerable we are, right? Like, so this, all that red is pretty much herbaceous or grassy fuel. So down the lowlands, it's almost all, all guinea grass on Oahu. And as you get up higher in the elevation, you kind of, these ferns and things like that. But, you know, we're kind of, surrounded by these high risk fuels that are really flashy, catch easily when it's dry out. So uh, we're vulnerable. Uh, and just more examples of kind of the difference, right? So you can have, these are like classic Kona side of the big island where you just get these uninterrupted uh, grasslands. And so this is like this horizontal continuity. Which is, so when we get about mitigating and trying to changing the vegetation, we're worried about fire spreading horizontally on the land, um, but with these woody fuels, it's more about the potential for fire to jump up. And so you can disrupt both of these, right? You can kind of break up that horizontal continuity, but you can also manage the vegetation to kind of reduce the risk of it jumping up uh, and other damaging trees or other resources you might be worried about protecting. And again, this is all on pacificfireexchange.org and you can search, this is the planning guide I'll we'll talk about all these pieces to be considering. Um, and I just went over this. The fuels management part, again, these are the two components. So that vertical arrangement, horizontal arrangement, and it's all about reducing the connectivity and the quantity, right? And so fuel breaks and fire breaks. So there is a technical difference here. <laughs> fire break is like a dirt road, right? Like something where you just scrape it down to the earth, bare earth. Um, and the fire will have like less chance of spreading on that unless it like jumps. Um, and there's a rule of thumb there where you want it to be about three times the height of the vegetation. So the width of your break about three times the height of the vegetation. But when we talk to firefighters about that, they just say, make it as wide as you can. Um, Cause often that three times is a hard target to hit. If it's like low statured grass, it can be, it can be pretty easy. Um, backing up so a fire break is that dirt just bare dirt a fuel break is kind of like here on the on the side where it's it's just man it's like trimmed or mowed you can graze it you can use herbicide but you, it's basically altering the vegetation so that there's less vegetation to burn and that will result in a slower moving fire it will result in a like a less intense fire um and the other thing to kind of note about fuel breaks and fire breaks as well is that they're really there to provide the firefighters with an opportunity to stop the fire, right? It gives them a space from which they can work and try to make sure that fire doesn't jump the break. It's not really designed or you can't really count on them to stop the fire uh, alone. Um, I'm not gonna talk about prescribed fire. That's like using controlled burn to reduce fuels today, but um, that's another method that people use elsewhere. Um, so yeah, fire break is a dirt road. And a fuel break is kind of mode where you change the vegetation. And the reason we don't typically and others don't recommend fire breaks is that it can increase erosion. And that's the big risk there. It's like it can, it's more solid. Like you don't have to worry so much about a fire creeping across it. Um, but then you introduce this problem of erosion and, and maintenance is, is kind of hard uh, in them. So like I said, three times the height of the surrounding vegetation, 40 to 60 feet. When we just asked, we, we actually interviewed firefighters in Hawaii and Guam, what they recommend. And, and that's kind of like their ideal um, when they do it. That's what they try to aim for. So, and then also in the landscape, we're trying to think about anchor points. So these are like roads that aren't going to burn, or maybe they're water features, right? So it's like, any way you can get creative, like rocky outcrops where you can shorten the length of these fire breaks. If you can imagine trying to like protect some patch of forest and kind of maintaining and establish these around your, your zone, you want to kind of use features in the landscape that won't burn so you can save yourself work. Um, they're also more effective because I showed you those slides where the fire is burning super hot and fast uphill. They tend to be more effective at the bottom or the top of slopes, right? Where you're not going to get a fire running up the hill, which gives them more chance to, to jump. And you really want to reduce the woody debris. The more woody debris you have along a fire break, the more chance you're going to get embers. And that's 
creates what we call spotting. And so a spot fire is like when an ember flies and it can fly over your fire break way ahead. I mean, miles in some cases out in front of the fire and start a new, you know, ignite another part uh, of the landscape. And then the biggest problem with fire breaks is maintenance. And especially in our grassland or these grassy areas, uh, it's just an ongoing task. Um, you're talking, you know, at least once a year, often more, uh, if you get heavy rains and the grass comes back. And so that that's a challenge. And, you know, in res with respect to that, there's some, people are exploring alternatives that I'll get to in a minute. Uh, but here's an example of one where it was along a road in Makaha, uh, but they did not clear the woody vegetation along the sides. So this was just either it spotted or it just, you know, bent over that fire. It just jumped over this road. And so we actually had a break that we were working, we we're changing the plants above this um, that held that break. Did, the fire didn't go across that break, but they weren't maintaining along the roadside and it just jumped there and burnt right around. Here's another one. Um, so clearing wood debris, these guys put in a little fuel break along um, their coffee farm, but they stashed all the debris under their windbreak here. And so when it burned, it killed all the coffee like along the edge, but it also killed the trees in their windbreak. So just that's the, the effect of kind of dealing with the debris that you remove is you just don't want to just stack it up along the roadside because that can also create risk. And then grazing, I mean, there's evidence that it works. This graze paddock was probably overgrazed, but you can see like where they were kind of hammering it. Um, this is right at Keau, like just to... Uh, um, north of Makaha, um, you know, the fire went right up to the edge and, and didn't burn into this grazed paddock. So it, it can work. But again, if you're in like really high, high risk conditions, really, really windy conditions, um, they've seen paddocks uh, burn over as well. So it, it's definitely a strategy that will reduce risk. And even if this were burning, it would be a much safer, easier fire to manage for firefighters it would not be this, you know, big wall of flames. Um, and this is the kind of strategy that a lot of folks are exploring and, and working on in Hawaii, given the maintenance problems, um, but also given that it lines up with a lot of other goals that projects have, which is like, you know, reforestation or even doing agroforestry, planting food trees. There's a lot of evidence, uh, especially out in the Western Pacific, of these fires in these grassy areas burning up to these closed canopy forests and just laying down, like literally just going out at the edge because when you plant trees and alter that vegetation, it retains all the moisture, it's shading everything, and it, the grasses can't really grow into and penetrate these areas. And so it, it's, a, it's a green break. It just serves as a, it's like a different kind of vegetation that's less likely to burn. Um, and so this is an example of one that DOFA has been working on, Division of Forestry and Wildlife in y and I, um, and what this has allowed them to do, now actually both sides of the road look like the right hand side. So this is actually native plants. They're using weed mat. So they kind of do a combination where they'll, they'll um, control the grass, spray it actually with herbicide, and then lay down weed mat, and they've been planting trees. And, and this is years ago already. So this thing, these trees are about twice the size. And they've actually established it on the other side. But this is a kind of proof of concept where DOFA is out able to drive up this road and do take suppression actions along this road and put out spot fires and things. And, and before that, they would never even think about going up this. It, it looked like that last slide where it was just like wall to wall, Haole on, the, on either side. Um, and this is right above that place that burned over. This is kind of another example where they had a bunch of native plants like a veo veo um, and some, I think Dota Nea Ali'i planted in here. And unfortunately, like the fire was coming from the left hand side and it stopped on that side of the break, but then it burned around below and came up on the other side and just killed all the plants. So um, it's kind of a sad outcome, but at least it was a, again, like proof of concept that the fire didn't pass through the green break itself. Um, so they're actually re-establishing this in, in Makaha too. So like how to do this is still up, up in the air, but it allows us for like experimentation. It allows us to play with the plants that we want to use. Um, but you're trying to exclude the grass. That's the game here. You're trying to plant close enough that you the grass can't establish or trees that shade it out. And that's the benefit that we have of most of our grass species do not tolerate shade. And so if you can get a canopy established and keep the fire out while it's establishing, um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a 
good long-term strategy. Um, if you can irrigate, you're in business, right? Like if you can get water to these things, but in the short term, you kind of need to figure out how to how to prevent them from burning if, if you're in a really high risk area. And yeah, like I also showed this slide because if we have irrigation and we have, um, you know, the resources, we can totally change the landscape. We don't not necessarily want to put golf courses everywhere, but like Makaha, the whole valley burned in 2019 or 2018 rather, except for the golf course, right? And it just it just shows goes to show like if we have the resources, uh, you know, we have the knowledge. There's the knowledge about caring for plants and and changing the, the vegetation, and it's not it's not outside of our uh, control at all. And then these resources can be found again at PacificFireExchange.org. So if you need to, uh, you can look up planning guide or fuels management, um, and you will find all this information is in those guides. There, there's kind of quick versions of it, like the shortcut cliff notes, as well as kind of more detailed uh, guides for this stuff. And I think that's what I got. Um, you can also ask me uh, if you've got any specific questions. Um, you know, if you're watching this on the video and want to ask about your place in particular, just reach out, please, anytime. Perfect. Mahalo, Clay. Um, yeah. I guess I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to keep it to two or one. I'm looking across the street and I see Albizia wondering if, I guess that a few slides back, you have different species. Are certain species more threat than others? I guess trees yeah. wise. You mean tree wise? Yeah, like the Albizia. I mean, what the problem with Albizia is it's kind of got that kind of open, wimpy canopy. There's other problems with Albizia though that make it worse, and that's the during high wind events it just drops limbs. It's just not safe. Um, but for sure, I think there's certain species that will cast more shade than others. You know, um, that's why I think mango is probably a cool one to think about. Even kukui, um, they probably would work better than than native um, plants. I mean, a lot of people outside of fire context, but in like restoration, for example, they love koa because koa shed so many leaves. And after that koa is, you know, five, six years into that koa growing big and it's dumping so much leaf litter that at, that also helps suppress grass um, underneath it. Um, but definitely there's a difference. For example, eucalyptus is kind of a bad one. <laughs> and the reason is it's, it produces all these oils that are volatile, but the, the problem isn't that, it's those oils prevent the breakdown of the leaf litter and the branches that it shed and the bark. And so what happens under eucalyptus is you get this long-term buildup of this, you know, woody debris underneath it that that, you know, I've seen fires at Palihua in particular, where under those eucalyptus that have burned, it's just like nuking straight up to the canopy. I mean, you, you wouldn't believe it. Um, so for sure there's a difference. We're we're trying to just look at like shade, shady canopies or succulent plants in the short term. Um and honestly, like anything on irrigation is probably going to be a better alternative than than guinea grass. Awesome. Um, any questions? Anybody? Evil. Hello, Evil. Oh yeah. How's it? Um, sorry, I'm late. Um, Freeze. Oh, Kevin. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I, I remember once trying to buy a large piece of land in Wahilwa, and part of the project was to eventually build, like, a fire buffer. But how, how, um, how often do you uh, get inquiries from like, is this a, a luxury um, thing for someone who owns a lot of land? Or is it, because uh, I think the the, main, the big cost to me is sort of like you said, you can do it once and then you got maintenance if you want to keep it going. And okay. we have a lot of communities who in some cases have some large pieces of land where they may need this, but it's a question of whether it's more of a, you know, a, a luxury line item. Yeah, I, 
I mean, I think it, again, it goes back to like what you're trying to protect. Right. So like, obviously what is the risk of fire in that zone? And then like, you know, there's lots of areas. So for example, there's this chunk of land between Kekaha and Waimea on, on Kauai where it burns like every other year and people freak out when there's fire up there, but there's nothing up there. Right. It's just Guinea grass and Halikoa. And so the forestry division and fire the K KFD like they they just let it burn to the road and then they stop it right they're not worried about the fire passing through there but um yes yeah, so again so part of it's like what resources like do you have or what things are out there that you're trying to protect and then um the strategy wise is again i think it is luxury in the sense that like it's hard to get funding for this and i think this is why we see so little relatively speaking such little implementation of these actions right at scale like there's definitely people doing it at small scale small parcels um but it's it's hard work and uh often people are resorting to like they're just sick because they're like they're using herbicide you know more than they want to, to just to fight the grass and and again it's also something that it's not a, a new problem, right? Like people have been trying to figure out how to deal with guinea grass for over a hundred years now. Um, but that's a really good question. I think you have to suss out like what this, like how valuable is, is what's at risk. And that's why I saw also the most action that we see the most sort of, uh, it's not compliance. It's like the interest in this is from homeowners, right? Because that's, you no. have a direct stake in it. And, and, and unfortunately, the state at this point doesn't have the resources to make funding available to help larger landowners. Um, there are resources though through Forest Service. U.S. Forest Service has this uh, wildland urban interface uh, program that they fund. And there's another one called the Wild wildfire community defense fund so there are federal grants that people go after to to support this um some of the other bigger actions where we see kind of landscape scale management um is working like pool pool vava on the the forest reserve there they work with grazers to sort of do mm. tar grazing along the roadside and they maintain fire breaks along the roadside Again, there because they've got these really um you know high value in the sense of rare plant um, and dry forest patches and things like that. But yeah, I think that's like a sad way to think about it, but it's right. It's correct in the sense of this, like a luxury item. It's like, it's hard to get the resources to, to do this, um, at scale. Um, uh, Chuck, so I have another meeting to go to, but, uh, I have another question maybe you can answer and I can watch the video sure, sure. later. Um, so since it currently is a luxury item, do you see any trends towards not making it a luxury item, you know, like I listen to the radio now, you know, it's a climate and investment issue, I think. And listen to the radio now, you know, there I, I heard some guys talking about how do we change the discussion around summer being a good thing? <laughs> that that summer and sunshine now is actually um a health a health threat. Yeah. Uh, well, in some places it, now. Like, what, what's gonna it. change it for um people with land in this case and the stuff you're working on here. Yeah, well, that's kind of one of the things I've been trying to help our fire protection forest, the division of forestry is to get the state to try to like not depend on federal funds and not depend on like individual projects and actually create. So California, for example, and Oregon just did this where they created like a state fund to help people pay for this kind of work, right? So you recognize that fire is at a risk uh, to your community or to a parcel of land that you're trying to protect. Watershed forest, for example, is a key one that we, we say that we need to protect. Um, and what we're seeing with successive fires is that lower edge is just like eroding away. Big Island, it's like the upper and the lower edge eroding away from these fires. And so um, I think one of the ways forward is just to try to work and hammer the legislature. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I don't, I don't really care. Um, but to say like, there's a need for this, they're already doing this in other states. And then that would be a fund that you would make available to people that have mitigation projects they wanna propose. Um, the other 
places where it's working really well, uh, and I would encourage if folks who are interested in this is like on Molokai, where they're coordinating across large landowners and small landowners, and they're really planning together doing these uh, networks of fuel breaks and fire break roads. Um, and they have seen results. Like they've went from having these large, large fires um, in Molokai and the last few that have happened around um, Kauna Kakai have been much smaller. They've been able to, uh, to basically to cut them off and, and uh, reduce the footprint. So yeah, combination of coordinating with the people that have the skills, right? And, and people are willing to help when the fires are happening, man, every, all these construction companies with dozers, they're all out there, like good fellas, like they're all out there to help. And so I think, you know, trying to, um, we're just trying to get people to do it before the fire is happening. Interesting. Um, Eva, sorry, I I think Kevin had jumped in. <laughs> Go for it. No, that's okay. I um I just wanted to comment and um uh, you know so my I I really appreciate this. I mean I got all these notes. <laughs> um you know especially for our, our task up here on the Mauna, it's it is daunting, but um you know I think the landowners are trying to work together and and do some prevention up here. But you guys gave me a lot of good tips in this, you know, Kuka, um, this talk story session, things I want to change already, grass we need to cut further down, um, things like that. And, and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Clay, and, and everybody for this. Time. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's like what Kevin was getting at, too. It's just there's like you know, that goes to like this fundamental shift we need to kind of make is like that this stuff is valuable, right? Like, it, it, and the work that you guys yeah. are doing it is valuable. We, we, so it, it's this part of that same problem. Um, what does it take to keep the stuff that we love, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very you cool. know, and maybe it's something too that we can also teach the, the keiki when they come up, you know, the schools that come up. Um, not just learning about conservation, but um, protecting and preventing, you know, um, you know, what you've talked about too. So I really appreciate this. Um, yeah, we'll no just problem. continue to share, you know, what you've taught us here and, and make sure everybody knows. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. And it's also crazy to think about that. And on a coolie, for example, like I've talked to some of the old timers there where it's like just maybe three or four fires ago, right? There was like willy willy. You had native trees and things yeah. like down in the valley. Like it was there. And I mean, what really kind of, well, it's like heartbreaking, uh, that big 2018 fires that were burning Maka, Waianae and Keao, like Keao Valley probably had the largest stand of willy willy left mm -hmm. on the island. And it's like that one single event, it's gone pretty much, right? So that understanding that like, I don't know how we just keep telling these stories. It's like, I think it's pretty yeah. important. Um, yeah. That's scary. Time for one more. Sure. Okay. Um, my name is Ginger. Sorry, I came late. Um, I, and I don't think I have a question as much as I just wanted to share, um, like what I experienced living, um, in an area prone to fires around me. So I live in, um, Javi in North, Ko North Koala and, you know, woke up this morning to notifications about the two fire, you know, we have two neighboring communities on fire now. Um, and every year between now and September, it's always, you know, kind of expected that, you know, this drier side of um, Kohala will experience a fire that overtakes the highway, the lower, the lower road. Um, and they're usually able to put it out, you know, in a few days. Um, but where, I live is the beginning of kind of like the more heavily residential area. So between here and the fire today, which is about 15 miles, mostly kind of um, dry, 
grass, kiabe, ranch lands, private property, like huge expanses. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a few hours today when both roads were closed due to one, the lower road was closed due to the fire and the, the Malco road was closed due to of trees that were falling because of the wind. And that's the scariest thing to me, because if we don't have roads to be able to, you know, get out of here if we have to, or or if I'm just even thinking way too far ahead that, you know, for it to get to that point. But, that, you know, that's what I think of, um, you know, because we hear a fire and we're expecting not just that element, but lines being cut down i mean yeah. um electricity so food storage or you know just basic debris falling on our houses um or in the roads so it's it's a lot more major than just that one kind of location where the, the action is um and i guess i mean in all of this, I really don't know, like as a community, I'm sure like the ranches have these fire management strategies in place. They've been dealing with it for a lot longer, for a long time. And, um, but I think like the questions I have, I don't even know who to place them to because it's sort of like on the line of what's the longest fire, you know, or what's the largest expense of fire? Because even just two years ago, one year you go with the Waimea fire and at Parker Ranch. And I had the privilege of helping out with those guys, the ranch hands who were in charge of putting out the fire right. and doing the breaks, not the fire the fire department did not get involved in 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 every area so yeah. it's it's up to these guys who are younger than me you know who you know are prepared i guess but it's just astonishing like the power of the community and so you know our community being kind of way located at the end of the road versus waimea which is so accessible to other places it's like you see them coming together through messages, like direct messages or Facebook. We can't rely on the news. We can't really rely on the county text to keep us involved, informed. It's really grassroots the way we support each other still. Um, I really would like to highlight the power of that in these conversations um, because having those, a strong community is paramount in these yeah. natural disaster type things. Um, and, and yeah, so anyway. <laughs> no, it's true. It's like we, you, you, the, for like warning and kind of like understanding what's going on, there's like no substitute to people that are there on the ground. And it's the same, even on Oahu, like we had this, meeting after this 2018 fire was like kind of beginning of COVID times and we we're like people are like how do we even do this but we started getting together because we we're like when's the next one it's going to happen and what do we do and so that's really when we started working with some of the farmers in the lower valley and connecting them with guys in the back who've been doing stuff but just to like expand that network and enough people are like affected that's kind of what it took unfortunately where it was like all these farmers were so affected by that big fire that they were like, okay, yeah, we got to, we got to do stuff. But even then, like we had a fire happen and it was like within a couple months of the first meeting that we had. And all of a sudden, everyone that was at these meetings, they all had their numbers. And so everyone was texting everybody and they were able to like let the fire trucks in on the farms right away and get up to it. And they were able to like contain this next one. So it was like way smaller. And it was just so cool to see that all, we had to get together, right? Like we couldn't have done it doing a webinar or like other any other way. It was just like people were concerned. They met about it. We were trying to figure out like how do we share resources and and you know what kind of things we can do. Um, and it's totally. I think it probably any natural disaster you could think of. It's probably the same situation. Um, yeah. I would just give one one plug in that sense is like what uh, Hawaii Wildfire Management Organization has been trying to do in this. So they work with like Kailapa and Pukapu over there, like where they've been trying to do these firewise communities. And it's it's just like a little bit of try to nudge the communities themselves, just like stay in touch and try to understand like what resources are there 
and helping each other. It's like planning community, like cleanup days and things like that. So just, just like, you know, like neighborliness, I guess. <laughs> One more thing that I thought of too, while you're talking, this is all great information. Yeah. Uh, I think don't, I never, I, I think that there can never be too much information when it comes to this stuff, but after like what I'd seen and witnessed in that Waimea fire that happened on Parker Ranch Lands is the amount of um, trauma that happened in that community. And these <clears throat> guys who were working to put out fires that day, which lasted for many days, um, there was no support given to them post fire yeah. and all of like putting their lives on the line, all of the, the, you know, dangerous things that they had to do um, was never really addressed. And I do think that's an important thing to also um, um, prepare people for is to create those pathways after you get out of it, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I will just say like, we've done, more on like the sort of physical side of that but not like the mental emotional side because yeah going through that experience is, is very heavy um and we've been really kind of more thinking about ah like how do you you know deal with erosion and, and how do you deal with like that that kind of stuff but it, it is you're right i mean it is you uh it changes the whole place where you are right and it's sort of like you're like dealing with all this ash and smoke and then just being through that experience and I feel that I see it like there was a lot of news in the news people are really angry right they're upset about how it started in the first place and everyone wants to point fingers like who started it and I mean yeah it's a tough situation to sort of feel supported um when you're not right like and that then that's kind of going back to that original point like there's so little being done before these things happen that the outcome is doesn't have to be as bad as it is and and like the agencies that we rely on like during the incident all of them they're like constantly saying like we need more pre-suppression is what they call it often it's like we need more like resources there we could like minimize the impact that these have and and also i mean they're thinking like on the landscape but that's like you know, physical toll it's taking on people um and there's just again it's it's like what we've seen in hawaii is not that climate change is happening it's not that um you know we're it's it's more that the landscape has changed and we have not adapted to um, that change. Like we have not increased, for example, the amount of firefighters that are out there uh, because now there's no ranch, there's fewer ranch hands and there's no plantation and there's none of that water infrastructure and irrigation, like none of that's out there anymore. We haven't adapted to that. And all of a sudden there's all these huge expanses of, of what were plantations and we're probably much healthier farmland before that even that are just left fallow um and we can't just have that and, and it stays that way and expect this to get better but from all that context as far as like natural disasters are concerned i think the one thing that gives me hope with fire is that like it's not rocket science like we we can change the landscape i mean this is like the dumbest example of this picture on the, on the screen like the a golf course is not going to burn right um we don't want golf courses again but it's just that this is sort of within our power to change um it's just a matter of like, is it, is it worth it? Like, I don't know. I mean, obviously I think I know what I think, but how do you kind of have that bigger conversation? Of like, how do we prepare ourselves? It's not, it's not like we're at the, we're victims or something, or we're like, even like saying, oh, we're so vulnerable. It's just that we're not really taking the actions that we could be taking to, to alleviate all of that emotional trauma, the physical changes and the damage that happens, it, it's really not like, a, it's not outside of our control. It's wholly within our control. And that might, maybe that makes it more frustrating. I don't know. But thank you for sharing, Ginger. That was, um, yeah, you raised some points that I haven't ever really talked about in any of these, these talks that are really, really important. Very cool. Mahalo. Mahalo, Clay, for making time and mahalo, everybody, for making it through the recording and spending time. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll share the information and um, we'll be in touch. Um, I guess this last piece about this picture, like 
if it's not a golf course, maybe it used to be a lo'i, totally a patch, right? Totally, and so like yeah. our our traditional systems being uh fire mitigation, how do yeah. we we work that right? So and um, you have it like that fire it was 2012 fire that burned up through um you know, Uncle Eric's property up, up you know, a call a farm. And the only thing that didn't burn was the low E, right? So it's yeah. it's totally within our like the, the knowledge is there and how to care for these places. So that's why I kind of started at the beginning is like probably most of the stuff that you guys are working on is like fire mitigation, right? It's like making the place safer. It just how do we kind of do it at scale and across and kind of share and do it bigger. So Beautiful. anyway, thank you guys for having me. Beautiful. Thank you guys. Have a good day. Yeah. Oh, right. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, no worries. Anytime.